I want to uh, I want to start by asking Dr. Coverstone a couple of questions I have about kind of bigger picture theoretical stuff and work into a couple of questions I have about getting down to the student level, the impact. Who are we trying to impact, and what are we actually doing for them? What's actually being done in the innovation zone? So, high level question. Part of what you're doing is changing the structure and organization of the schools and the system. Part of what you're doing is doubling down on the theory that strong leadership will make a change. And I know it's nearly impossible to pull apart the st structural changes from the leadership changes. But do you have a sense of like, is it 50-50? Is it, how do those two things relate to one another? Well, I wouldn't put a specific percentage on it. I, I think leadership is most important. But I think that the structural elements that we were uh, looking into are things that are designed to protect the prerogatives of leadership, for lack of a better way of describing it. And so in the absence of structural, uh, st structural separation, for example, and structural autonomies, the likelihood is that decisions that will be made by the leaders will be directly second-guessed or directly limited, and because that possibility exists, more on a psychological level, I found that the leaders were less likely to take risks and less likely to engage in decisions that would lead them to something <coughs> different from what was being done. Uh, and that was in part because they were afraid of what would happen down the road, even if in practice none of that would actually happen. So let's say you could expand the structure to as many schools as needed it all across the state of Tennessee. How do you get enough leaders to be able to capitalize on the structure? Yeah, that's, that's the million dollar question. I'm definitely getting enough leaders and getting the right leaders, I think, is the limiting variable on all of this. And part of that, part of that is why um, I gravitate toward multiple approaches because I think there are different leaders who come through different approaches. And definitely, I, I got that experience from my experience with charter schools because uh, what makes a strong charter school is the same thing that makes a strong district school or any other school and it gravitates toward that leadership. But there are some people who are both more likely to lead in a charter school setting and also more effective in a charter school setting who are going to become leaders as a result of that opportunity being available than if we shut it off altogether. And on the converse, there are people who are more likely and effective in a district setting who are going to be effective, so we shouldn't charterize everything. We should try to maximize our leadership inputs. So what do you know about who's most likely to be effective and willing to be effective in an I-Zone school? Well, uh, we tried to borrow a lot of the same kind of concepts about who is likely to be effective from the charter sector. So these are people who are entrepreneurial in their spirit, who um, tend to think about the people on their team and how those people can be deployed to maximize their skill, their skill usage effectively. Um, and then uh, we were really assisted by thinking about um, turnaround competencies, the work that's been done on turnaround competencies, and using that as a screen for people who would be good leaders in a setting that you know, is otherwise uh, under some duress. So I think we've all seen schools that have had made tremendous gains under strong principal leadership. Principal moves on to something else, and you think you have the next best person in line to come through, and it doesn't work, right? And you talk about financial sustainability, but what have you learned about leadership sustainability? So I think that leadership sustainability has got to be built on teams. I, what you, if, if it's it, succession planning is important, but if that one succession plan breaks down, as you mentioned, it can break down the entire thing. And so, uh, when we were working on internal school level design, um, we really gravitated toward designs that were about groups of people working together with different roles and responsibilities that they could grow into, but you might have three or four people who could grow into one responsibility when the time was right for that person to grow into that responsibility rather than a linear, a linear path. One of the things that I think uh, people who are opposed to using charter schools for turnaround, one of the reasons that they're opposed is that they're afraid about the impact that charterization has on the overall community. Uh, the breakdown, segregation of schools, the breakdown of community commitment to a system of public schools. What have you seen in, with the I-Zone and the way that it's impacted the larger community's commitment to public education? Well, I have to go all the way back to 
kind of the theory behind the charter schools office. The reason that it was important to me to have a charter schools office within the district and to have our authorization be within the district was so that we could leverage authorizing of charter schools to advance those common purposes. So I think it makes a difference if it's our school, if it's something that we've committed to, and if it's something that is targeted to specific needs in the community that we've identified. So we make our charter applicants identify the needs in the community and identify how they'll meet them and really be a part of the community to get from, from the get-go. So that's the large answer to that question. The more uh, microscopic answer, how did, it, how did the innovation schools affect it? Um, I, you know, I think I, I probably would answer that by saying that the, the thing we've been the most successful with is in just creating a sense of urgency to, to address turnaround in a way that we previously didn't really have a sense of urgency for addressing turnaround. As I said, it was kind of addressing it all in one size. And um, so the turnaround schools and the innovation schools in particular fit into the larger community effort now because that's part of what we're trying to accomplish as opposed to being something that's a one-off. So Nashville residents would still feel like the I-Zone schools are their schools. It wouldn't feel like it's something apart. Yeah, and I think that's a really important source of friction with the ISD, but also um, you know, reason why there's motivation for people to get behind the innovation schools. Um, one of the things that I puzzle about that's uh, in the education reform debate is the extent to which our dialogue frames of teachers as problem versus teachers as solution. And clearly you made some important changes in who some of the teachers were in your schools. How do you think about that? How do you think about that duality in those two perspectives? Well, I mean, I think teachers are the solution is clearly how I think about that. Um, you can't just eliminate teachers and hope to replace them all with you know, magic, high-performing teachers. Um, there's just not a long enough line. If there was, they'd be getting the jobs. So the way that we looked at that was to really dig into differentiating the roles that teachers had. So instead of needing you know, 20 outstanding teachers, we tried to build designs where we'd need four. And those four then would be in charge of teams of teachers, many of whom were newer, younger teachers who were learning and growing. And they were learning and growing as part of that team. Uh, but they were also in classroom settings where that master teacher was actively working to teach alongside them and actually splitting the responsibility for teaching students so that they were not just coaching and not just teaching. They were doing development as well as team leadership at the same time. And to uh, provide opportunities for those master teachers to be paid a little bit more, we also instituted at the back end an aspiring teachers program. So we had essentially teaching residents in the building as well, which made it possible to have more adults in the room and more people on the team. So I think the answer to that question is, Teachers are the, are the solution, but we can't ask every teacher to do exactly the same thing all the time. We need to think about breaking up those roles. I know that one of the criticisms of uh, the Recovery School District in New Orleans is that it has displaced a lot of veteran teachers. And you just mentioned the, emphasis, the, the importance of the new teachers in your schools, and obviously all schools are going to have new teachers coming in. Has that been a criticism that's come up in Nashville, that veteran teachers have been displaced? Yeah, uh, more so though in the case where you're converting to a charter school than in the case where you have an innovation school. Um, definitely there's some displacement, but there were also teachers who you know, wanted to leave um, and wound up teaching in other schools, and, and many of them were more successful in other schools. Uh, but the teams that were on the ground in the schools, in the innovation schools, you know, included some of the people who'd been there before, but also some new people. So some schools in Nashville are being added to the I zone. Some are being converted to charter school. How is the decision made of which school goes which direction? Um, I wouldn't say there's a huge strategy behind that decision. I'll just be real upfront about that. Um, you know, we we tried this first thing with this middle school. Um, we've subsequently launched a conversion a year ago. Um, with an elementary school. That's all the conversions that we've done directly through the district. There are also two achievement school district conversions that are going on. Um, we'll, left to our own devices, if we had a strategy, 
I think we would probably use a little more charter capacity because I think there is a little bit more available, not a lot, but a little bit. Um, and we would try to use what's available so that we were maximizing our resources. Um, but pretty quickly, the dichotomy developed, at least politically and internally, between the Achievement School District, which tends to use charter schools, and Innovation Schools, which tend not to. And so that became part of the standard operating procedure rather than a strategy. So uh, you know that the Public School Forum has two other study groups going on at the same time, and I want to ask you a question about the topics that each of those groups think about how their work is overlapping with, with this. In the model of change that you showed us, one of the elements that the district was emphasizing was a commitment to equity and excellence. Can you tell us more about that and how it's playing out in, in the district and in the I-Zone schools? Yeah, the, the, it's playing out much more in the district than it is in the I-Zone schools. The equity component of the I-Zone schools is really creating opportunities for students who previously have not had great opportunities, and that provides an, a more equitable opportunity for those students. In, broader terms, the district is um, has embraced a diversity management plan and really has a priority on um, doing what it can to make decisions that will promote diversity in its schools. The, the, but the hard reality of the turnaround schools is that there isn't a lot of diversity in, the, in those schools and it's been very difficult for us to engineer that, uh, particularly short of achievement gains and some successes coming out of the schools. So what have your uh, turnaround schools done to focus on specifically addressing the needs of black and brown students and poor students? Well, particularly, we've had to, I, we've had to spend a good bit of time on cultural competency, particularly having a large population of younger teachers, white teachers, um, teachers from different backgrounds from the students. Um, but we've also um, taken a real serious attempt to be in the community and be visiting house to house and getting to know families in that capacity. So it's been a personal relationship type of approach rather than something that's systematic. So our other study group is focusing on trauma and learning. And I know uh, that in your slide on the turnaround model, you had the part about readiness to learn. It seemed like that it was at least acknowledging a little bit about circumstances from which kids come and that trauma may be impacting them. What, what work have you done on that? Yeah, and that's it's the biggest challenge of the turnaround setting is that you know, where you might have four or five students in a classroom that are experiencing that level of trauma in these turnaround schools, you have 10 to 12 to 15 to 20 students who are experiencing high levels of trauma all, all at the same time. And it's one of the reasons that it is so challenging to do the work um, as, as, far as, as far as it goes. In fact, most of our um, turnaround schools are turnaround schools that are kind of located in traditional housing units. And um, they, as a result, are um, constantly facing the challenge of trauma with students. So what we've done about that is connecting to community organizations and getting the, trying to make the walls of the school porous. I've already said we didn't accomplish that to the degree that we would have liked. But bringing those resources into the school gives the teachers a resource that they otherwise wouldn't have. That's number one. Number two, though, the role redesign that we've done has enabled us to have more adults in the, the classroom setting. So we've really, in most of these schools, gotten away from the idea of one teacher, one room, one door, close the door. Uh, and instead, you have at least two people in the classroom at all times, which makes it possible to address at least more physically address some of the um, some of the circumstances that are related to trauma but I mean it's it's the biggest challenge so last question if we think about the experience in in I zone school from a student's perspective uh, what are they going to walk away from saying that they had as an experience that would be different than a kid in another school. We, we know they have a longer school day, right? One hour longer. Maybe they have more teachers in their classroom as you just described. What else are they going to tell us? Well, I, you know, I hope that, I hope it doesn't, I hope they don't walk away and say I was in an innovation school. You know, I really hope they walk away and say I was in a great school. I had teachers that cared about me. I had relationships with other students. I had activities to engage in. And, you know, these, a lot of these schools have been really narrowed in terms of the opportunities for students. You know, in the, I think, vain belief that if we get down to just teaching reading and math, then we'll do better on the tests. And so um, we really have tried to stress more opportunities using the extra school time to create opportunities for students to be involved in, you know, all things that, that students in lots of high-performing schools are involved in.